Um, so now we've got our final session, uh, which is sustainable futures. Uh, so if you didn't have enough talking points uh, for the post conference social, which will certainly be loaded up after these last two sessions. Um, so the sustainable futures uh, topic, we're looking at it from two different uh, angles. Uh, one from the application, I suppose, of technology and how we might be able to use that to overcome economic, environmental, and social challenges. Uh, at that time. Um, and then we'll also uh, have uh, John will be speaking again. Some of you may have already uh, seen his earlier session, uh, but he'll be talking about ethics um, and basically, I suppose, the application of that uh, also to sustainable future. Uh, but first up, uh, we've got Roger Dennis. Uh, now, Roger uh, is a future uh, thinker, a um, and specialist in strategy and innovation, consults internationally in that field. He's also the founder of Sensing Cities, um, which is an initiative uh, here in Canterbury uh, for the use of uh, and data to overcome environmental and, and social issues. Um, we will be doing this a little bit differently than we have some of the other sessions. Uh, we will allow the clinic to disappear after a session, so we'll go straight into uh, hopefully a few questions uh, after this time. Uh, but without any further ado, I'll pass it over to Roger. Thank you very much. So um, before I talk about Sense and City and what it is, I want to give a little bit of background, which is quite important. And uh, so as mentioned in the intro, I hear a lot, and where is the world going and what does that mean? So if you look at uh, where the world's going from a technology point of view, there's a few things happening which are pretty much a, a given for the next decade or so. So first of all, the rise of big data in massive data sets, um, giving out insights that were previously not possible again. Uh, ubiquitous connectivity, so right now it's pretty much uh, harder to go offline than it used to be to go online 10 years ago. Uh, also, what you're seeing is um, sensor technology getting smaller and cheaper, but getting more and more advanced. So I um, talked at a conference at Stanford in November, uh, and met a guy there who developed a camera, the diameter of a human ear, that cost less than 10 cents. Right, so the technology curve has just gone like this. But at the same time, what you're seeing is that uh, on the infrastructure side of things, it's not quite matched. So there are more sensors in this $1,000 bit of equipment than there are in Christchurch's $5 billion wastewater networks and freshwater networks. Right, bit of an imbalance. Now, this becomes really interesting because actually no one really understands how cities actually work. Because no one has the data. Typically what happens is city planners sort of put the finger in the air, they try and derive some insights from a whole bunch of um, historical data, and then try and project forward. They do that because no one's got real-time data, because technology is sitting there curve, where it's only just now possible to start to understand the complexities of how dense urban environments actually work. Uh, last but not least, the important thing to consider when it comes to Century City is that Christchurch is unique geographically. So what normally happens when you have a, a disaster of the scale that Christchurch went through is you get wholesale regional devastation. So an entire area goes off the map. But most of you will know if you land at the airport and you drive in, you tend to go to Wadley's way. It's only when you have the CBD and the eastern suburbs you actually understand what the uh, damage has uh, been for Christchurch. So no one in the world is rebuilding the heart of a living city from scratch. That's what we're doing in Christchurch. And also what we're doing in Christchurch is spending an incredible amount of money to do so. So 32 billion US dollars, which is now considered to be relatively conservative, uh, spent in one location in one short space of time. And I'll give you some context for how that weighs up internationally. So I think when you put that together, it's a really interesting opportunity if you're going to rebuild the heart of a living city almost from scratch. And that's where Sensing City comes from. And really what the idea is to measure every and any variable you can in real time using sensors and pulling out data that already exists in the silos. So if you think about this, there's already information sitting around most uh, urban environments that isn't actually enhanced. Uh, if you go to a crossing and you see these little yellow pads on the crossing, flex your feet on them, you've actually got sensors inside them. You go up to the crossing, stand on the pad, hit the button, and it will trigger the flashing red or green light on the other side and walk away off the sensor pad or cancel it. What you also see is that uh, the Met Service in New Zealand has uh, granular weather information available already from Canterbury in four different locations. 
Uh, the bus system in Henry runs on devices that talk to space from your pocket, so GPS. I still find that quite extraordinary. Um, but that's based on sensors and analytics as well to predict bus times in conjunction with real time uh, GPS location. And finally, almost everybody's got a very sophisticated computer in your pocket that you can also make phone calls with. So those things load with sensors now, and you can do some fascinating things with those. One of my favorite examples is a MIT lab uh, based in Boston did an experiment in Copenhagen where they gave citizens the opportunity to download an app, and the app used the um, sensors in the phone, so the gyro, the accelerometer, and the GPS to uncover how people were commuting around the city. So basically it said that if your leg is doing this a lot, a certain motion, you're probably cycling. If you're doing that, you're probably walking. If you're sitting still and bumping a lot, you're either in a bus or in a car. Right, another team in Boston, uh, in the mayor's office, called the New Urban Mechanics Team, developed an app called Street Bump. So basically what happens with that is you download it, you start it up, and you're starting a journey into work. And if you um, go over a hole in the road, the uh, accelerometers and the gyros detect the motion on the phone. If enough commuters detect the uh, same pattern at the same location, it's a pothole. Right, so there's different ways in which you can harness the uh, computer in your pocket and the sensors to enable citizens to contribute to this as well. There's a few really important things about sensing city that we're looking at. So first of all, open data and open standards are absolutely critical, so it needs to be transparent. Uh, then we're looking at starting from bottom up as well as top down. So cities run on citizens, right? People in the city make the city, so you need to vote include them, not do this top down approach which is favoured by some technology vendors in some cities. Uh, also, we're not interested in looking at individuals. So I'm not interested in where you go for lunch between 12 and 2, but interested where things and resource flows move across the city during that time. And lastly, sort of linked to that, uh, you can opt in if you want to, by your phone, for example. It's a really important thing called the right to be forgotten. So say in three or four years after you opt in, you decide you want to actually to delete the data trail, actually take it out of the system all the way. Now, if you look around the world at how people have tried to solve the issues around cities, there's a few different ways, and one of them is to start from scratch. So this is a um, graphic taken from The Economist last year, where they looked at places around the world where they're trying to start cities from scratch, essentially. So the field of dreams approach, build it around the time. Uh, of note on that slide are two particular locations. One is in Korea called Songdu. Um, where Cisco, for example, dropped $46 million in the comms infrastructure, and one called Manstar, which sits in the Middle East. Now, Manstar, they've spent about $18 billion on. It's a city that's expected to have 50,000 people in it. It's built from scratch in the desert, and for $18 billion, they are still probably a decade away from completion. Manstar is a fabulous city. This is Manstar of Russia. So the population of Manstar is about 200 people right now. They work at the Manstar Institute, which studies Manstar. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty good for 18 billion dollars. We're spending 36 billion dollars rebuilding the heart of a living city where we have 436,000 people waiting to use it. Totally unique on the world scale. Now, also what you see when you go around the world looking at this, people often think this too jaded for data safe, survive off government handouts. That actually doesn't stack up long term. So we're interested in how you actually make this a sustainable business. And so we've spent a lot of time working with um, various teams around the world figuring out how you make money from data. So one of the first things we did was engage um, a group called Arup out of London. They're an engineering firm. You might have heard of them. Uh, we've got the Future Cities team working on this for us. Um, spent a lot of time figuring out how you make money out of this. There's three ways we think this is possible. First of all, um, giving access to the data. So um, much like longitudinal academic studies, the longer we have data about how a city works, the more value it accumulates. Uh, we think that there's a, a tiered pricing, uh, pricing model for accessing that information. So if you're a commercial organization like Cisco or Smith in cities, we'll charge you this. If you're an academic or a researcher, maybe middle, if you are a startup trying to understand how to create a new business using data, keep it more rental. Right, for the information you pull it out, there's a few thousand queries a day. If you're hammering a data score for a million queries a day, we'll charge you a lot more. Second of all, adding value to information and then selling it back. This is an organization out of the UK called Roadworks for All, as the name suggests, they do Roadworks information. What they do is they pull data out of various silos 
uh, around the UK from various organisations. They repackage it and they sell it back as valuable data for people to consume. So an example of that would be um, in Christchurch, uh, the city council is interested in how you do it park in Christchurch. So you know, their initial stab at this was um, you put sensors in parking spots, you make that information available, people can go into the city and find out where a park actually is. And that's a small part of the puzzle. Actually what you want to do is you want to find out weather information, event information, bus congestion, cycle lane utilisation, bike park availability. Because what cities actually want to do is a modal shift in transportation. People look out of cars, uh, onto buses, walking or into bike lanes. To do this, you actually have to understand where all the data sits that would encourage that modal shift to change pricing. So for example, at 6 a.m. the system says it's going to be a beautiful sunny day, buses are going well, all the bike parks are available in the city, traffic conditions are sort of okay, maybe we've got pricing up by 10 to 7 to Conversely, big event on, maybe it's a rugby game around the stadium, you want to change the parking pricing to discourage old gear enough to up the game. But you've got shuttle buses that are a shuttle park, make that parking free, change that parking pricing. The only way you can do that is if you understand how to manipulate various data sets, all the notice silos, and repackage it as a service that says actually today that park should be worth this much money. So value from data. Uh, lastly, we see a tremendous value coming from uh, positioning uh, Christchurch as the world's largest living laboratory for how to make this actually work. So I'm talking to a lot of corporations around the world right now. Uh, on Sunday I'm going to Shanghai, spending some time with an organisation uh, in China. Uh, on Wednesday I'm in Tokyo, talking to Mitsui. Uh, a couple weeks later we have Intel Labs coming down from um, Ireland and from California. All those organisations are interested in Christchurch because they see a massive opportunity where they can trial and test technology and then take it out to the world. It's like I say, no one's building the heart of the city from scratch. Now, our first project was purposely designed to address some of that issue around top down, bottom up, because first of all, there are no really smart cities in the world, it's a bit of a marketing term. The cities that like to see themselves as smart do it top down. So typically they say, uh, we will pull data out of the city and we will tell you what's going on. But now you can get, um, for example, school children developing uh, technology and sensor kits that will register air pollution in real time and then publish that data online. So why would you wait for somebody else to tell you what the air quality is like in an area that's important to you when you can do it yourself? So our first project was very deliberately based around crowdsourcing information. And we did a collaboration uh, with MIT, that's the MIT in Boston, not in America. And um, it was based around a mix of high-tech and low-tech. So uh, paper-based sensor technology, much like you would find used to test an aquarium or a spa pool, uh, mixed in with high-tech uh, using GPS and um, color calibration coding on a server. So people would go to a waterway, uh, dip a, a paper indicator into a waterway, uh, take a photo of the smartphone, upload the photo to a server at MIT, that would then analyze the color change from the strips through a calibration and say, actually, we think the water levels are low, medium, and high for these indicators at this particular location. So there's a website called littlewatersensor.com, and uh, we had about 150 school children going out and looking at water quality in the Avon and Hefka rivers. If you go onto the website, we'll pull up information about um, various indicators such as nitrates, pH, etc. So for MIT, the team's really interested in how they can use very cheap technology to make a difference in developing countries. So believe it or not, you can go to places around the world where villages do not know the quality of the water in their wells, but have smartphones. Right, they'll use those phones to link from some of the stuff that's taken decades to develop in the West, and they'll communicate online for market price information, weather information, a whole bunch of stuff. But they still have no idea about the quality of the water in the well. So this team at MIT is really interested in how you can take a low-tech, high-tech approach to combine that and roll out. So they're interested in testing this first of all in Christchurch. It's about $2 kit. We'll have a $5 kit or a $10 kit and take it out into Bangladesh or Infrared or wherever they want to go. For us, it's great because it's a uh, great collaboration with a good team at MIT, uh, and it also demonstrates how things are changing. So, for example, um, here is a headline from the press from last year, and if you look at the dates mentioned in the article, 
I want to talk to you about because it seems to be a one year lag before the ECAM releases information about water quality. Now, we can actually do that almost in real time. The school children going out and get quite coarsely little indicators of where things might be right or wrong. And if you take more sophisticated things to that location, you can do more than get analysis. So, this is a forerunner of uh, where things are going at that conference at Stanford. Uh, their guide was developing sensor tech which could do uh, real time E. coli levels and could be commercial in about six to 12 months. That's quite a leap from what you can do right now. The thing about that in Christchurch, so um, on a recreational kayak, out of the coast to coast, for example, I used to like training on the Hector River and told us that the E. coli levels in the Hector River I don't train there anymore. I would love to know in real time what the ECI levels are before I actually my boat in the river. Right. Fishermen would love to do that, surfers would love to do that. Right. But the information available just isn't there now. So it's only about, I'm guessing, 12, 24 months away that's commercially available. Our second project is a, a bit more in depth, and it's around um, people who suffer from a respiratory illness called COPD. And uh, New Zealand has the second worst incidence of COPD in the OECD. Too many acronyms there, but you know what I mean. Um, so this is a um, standard inhaler to control respiratory illness. So you do that, no data. Um, there's a good company in Auckland called Smart Inhaler, developed these, which are sensor packs, which when I actually uh, use to take a uh, puff, I'm going to flip Never works like that when I want to. Right, so in theory now when I do that, a little green light should flash on here, and that means it's transmitting the information. Now it's not works for the bottom anymore. Just think like that. One is like a small child with a puppy on the perfect trifecta for demonstrations. There we go. Nice little effect. So do that. And then with a little green light flashes here. Inside that's a, um, a Bluetooth transmitter, and that will transmit, hopefully, uh, to this phone. It worked about 10 minutes ago. And then this phone will tell me uh, when it was synced, and how often, and when it was used, and will go onto an app. And the idea is that the app downloads the cloud, and you get information about how often patients use their inhaler. Now, in line with that, what we're also doing is deploying air quality sensors across the city, because granularity doesn't currently exist. So it'll be the first place in the world to actually tell correlations between uh, air quality, good or bad, and respiratory uh, disease. Now, that's interesting because you think about the value that creates, first of all, for patients. First time they understand how often they're using medication and whereabouts and what it means. For their peer team, so the GP, for example, they get information and start to think more proactively about how to provide care. For the health system, uh, each time a COPD sufferer steps across the front door of hospital PD, it's near between $3,000 and $5,000 a day. Uh, and then for the city, you now start to understand how actually encouraging people to um, change their uh, heating method to their house has a direct impact on people's respiratory illness. So for this project, we're working with Callaghan Innovation, uh, City Council, Smart Inhaler, uh, the Geo Health team here at the University of Canterbury as well, and the uh, respiratory team of the DHB. This is a, a world first film we're doing. So it's a really interesting example of how uh, the world is changing in terms of sensor availability and data from places you would not normally expect to find it. It gives you insights that you've never been about before. So, We've been working on this for about two and a half years now. It's getting interesting attention. So at the start of the year, I went across to Johannesburg to the C40 summit. Uh, the C40 is a gathering of the uh, mayors of the 40 biggest cities in the world. And it was set up by Ken Livingston in 2005 with the idea that uh, mayors of mega cities can take action where nations can't. And in theory, no one in New Zealand should be invited across there because we have no mega cities. But they were so interested in sensing city and they could see where you know, digital overlays start to create value they got invited across. So I talked to representatives from seven cities across Asia, states, and Europe. And basically I said, how do we do this in our own cities? So there's an instant export market here. One of the things I want to create in sensing city is 
weightless, high value, exportable IP that starts a whole new industry in New Zealand. Right, so we proved that because of the interest from Joburg at C40, because of the interest from these multinationals. It's also getting international attention uh, from media outlets. So this is uh, from the Financial Times. Um, and this is a picture of school children dipping a little water sensor um, from the bridge in Beacon into the Hefka River uh, and getting coverage from the NFT for that. Um, one of the biggest things that's interesting about this and how you would um, start to approach this is people think that technology is really important, but it's not. Actually, I've spent most of my time convincing stakeholders that it's important, and that has um, borne out quite well. So, uh, a couple of faces you may recognize. Um, and this idea as well. Uh, <laughs> my trick is to convert their support through officials into money in our account to pick up a whole bunch of money. But um, at the end of the day, uh, the opportunity is there for Christchurch to attract smart talent from around the world. People can come here because it's unique and want to actually start an industry or a new business based on this sort of research. Uh, to create, um, uh, attract foreign direct investment. So there's organizations like Intel, Cisco, etc., are uh, interested in coming here and setting up teams, which means that actually what you do is create problems locally, you start to attract more talent, and you start to create this virtuous cycle around the job creation. And um, lastly, I want to create um, an ecosystem of innovation, whereby you have small companies and academics and researchers working with these large corporates to attract talent and retain and grow local talent so that Christchurch is known around the world as a centre for this. And when the cranes and hard hats disappear, we have a whole new industry based on sensors and data and analytics. Because at the moment, New Zealand depends on two things for its economy. One is um, cows, and uh, cows don't need passports to microorganisms that disrupt our food chain. And uh, second, backpackers. And backpackers are a low margin industry and can't scale. So uh, if New Zealand relies on those two industries indefinitely, the biggest risk is to become Fiji with no sun. Right now, we are spending $40 billion down the road. If we can't leverage a new industry out of that, we'll fail. So more information at these sites, uh, Facebook's for the interesting stuffers, uh, sensecity.org is the more corporate approach. I encourage you to look at those. And now we have five minutes of questions. <laughs>
kids that will actually measure uh, nitrites and nitrates, those are quite a force level. Uh, we think there is a lot of interest in how you can roll that out right across the country. Uh, plus also, the sensor technology is developing at a pace which means you do that detection in real time within two or three minutes. But what you want is the technology backbone, which actually allows you to pull together disparate data sources. So weather information, milk production, nitrate, and all that sort of stuff together becomes really interesting as opposed to putting in nitrates. So for example, um, there's a, a parallel project working in the rural area of Tasmania called Sensky, um, and they're working with uh, the wine industry and the aquaculture industry. They did some work around uh, oyster harvest times, and they added one more variable to data mix to increase the accuracy of harvesting production by 9 months. So, actually, pulling a different data source and not just nitrates, for example, you get much more valuable information. Thanks very much, Roger. Well, one of the disappointing things to many people about the redesign of Christchurch was it saw a very um, last century look about you know, let's have another convention centre um, and things like that. And whereas we should be looking at what's the most eco-efficient um, energy efficient systems that we could um, design. <coughs> and here was a superb opportunity to do it. To what extent do you think Sensory City could actually gather data which would actually test some hypotheses about uh, more efficient city design, better transport systems, better link houses for co-generation or whatever. Yeah, so um, the reason this Chinese company is so interested in adopting in Christchurch is because I've got a fascinating story. They started in 2007, it's been a long time. They started in 2007, they now have $1.7 billion in revenue. They started assembling wind turbines, and then they had clients coming to them and saying, how can we make our wind farms more efficient? So they took the data off things like blade deflection angles, turbine directions, turbulence patterns through wind farms, increased the efficiency of wind farms by 20% using data. And then they went, well, actually, to do that using wind, what do we do with solar and renewables? So they're interested in data around that. The next logical extension of that is how do you create energy efficient jets in environments using data? So they're interested in what they call the density of energy. Right. How can you pull data of energy sources to understand how you create a much more efficient system? Uh, but you have to pull it out of disparate data sources because no one's going to rent a lot from this. So one of the big problems with rebuilding you know, on, on this scale, people fail to grasp the complexity of the situation. And actually trying to get some sort of um, coherent energy approach across the city will never work because there's so many stakeholders. It might work in China or in Singapore, but in anywhere in the Western world. By understanding data feeds out of things like building management systems, HVAC, um, traffic systems, a whole bunch of stuff will give you a much better picture than the previous possible. Maybe we're wrong. 